Well, let me greet you this morning in the name and the love of the Lord. This last week, as I've been preparing the message, I was just amazed at the fact that even after over 45 years of speaking, it still feels like a privilege to be able to come and share the Word of God. And I realized the difference between uh, preaching and, say, a TED Talk. You all know what a TED Talk is? They've got these clips where people who are experts or versed in some area, they come up and they share their area of expertise. But I think speaking in the church to a body of believers is a special privilege. Because first of all, we're not coming to a book of wisdom. It is that. We're not coming to a collection of writings, which it is. But we are coming to the living Word of God. And it's different from any other book. Because contained here are words of life. Words that can change lives. Words that will bring hope. And most importantly, as contained in today's message, this is a word that brings life to that which is dead. Imagine the power that is contained within and without these pages. We are in the presence of the living God who longs to speak to us, His children. Isn't that a privilege? I want us to have that sense of awe as we come to this book of Ezekiel and join me in a word of prayer. O oh, living and loving Lord, we thank you that your word is not something that is just a few thousand years old that we venerate because of its age or even its content. We are in awe because this word lives. This word was there in the beginning. And by this word, all life has come to be. As we come before you, we are decaying. We are destined for death. There are things in our lives that are dead. And yet, your word declares that you are the Lord of life and that which was dead, even dry bones, can be brought back to life. What a wonderful revelation. So speak to us these words of life right now for we ask it and we open ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Very quickly. I was given some feedback, I think very helpful, and I should cut my introductions by half. <laughs> so I'll try and do that. We are in this sermon series from Genesis to Revelation, and it's up there on the um, banner. And we've gone all the way through in the second era. Uh, it is right on the borderline of the chaotic kingdom and captivity. The first 36 chapters of Ezekiel were written after Babylon had surrounded Jerusalem and Daniel and his friends and a group of people were, were taken. But right up to chapter 36, Ezekiel was still warning the people and saying, maybe you need to still turn from your sin. It's very late. It's the 11th hour and the 57th minute. But there's still some hope if you repent. But alas, they don't. And chapters 37, between 36 and 37, Ezekiel himself is taken to captivity by the rivers of Babylon. 
You know that song? What group? Bonium. Bonium. <laughs> hey, that reveals our vintage, or sort of. But this is where we are in this scenario. Ezekiel is now in captivity, and uh, Ezekiel is very complex. And I do encourage you to go and read the book of Ezekiel, but now you can go online and have some kind of study guide with you. Because I think if you read Ezekiel on your own, you're probably inclined not to be able to figure out what's really going on. So nowadays on the internet, it's so helpful that there are uh, commentaries and, and so forth. And if you go look for evangelical ones, <laughs> not the ones that tell you it's all imagery and, and uh, it's made and it was a style of writing, but find those who say, this is the word of God. This is what Ezekiel saw. And this is the application to your life. And this is some historical and um, linguistic and lit from a literature point of view an explanation for how we understand Ezekiel. So I do under, uh, encourage you to go and read it because there's so much material there. As I was looking at this, I realized I could probably speak a whole year <laughs> on the book of Ezekiel alone and still not get to the, the depth and the scope of what Ezekiel covered. That is the magnitude of this person's life and ministry. But one of the interesting things about Ezekiel's ministry was that it was very demonstrative. He, he would lie down on his right side for, uh, for two hours every day for a hundred days. That's kind of a unique way of getting a message across, isn't it? Imagine if every day I went to ICS <laughs> and, and right at the front in the morning I did something really weird like I just lay down on my side and say this represents this and then for the next term I'm lying on my left side and I say I'm here to show you something. It's like a hundred days I get it already. It's okay. I got it. I got it. But he would do this <coughs> repeatedly. One of the symbols that I want to bring to you is actually in uh, Ezekiel chapter 37, uh, you can read it, verse 15. We, we, we go on, Charles. Sorry, I'm skipping this. Uh, yeah, the, the next passage. Okay. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, take a stick of wood and write on it, belonging to Judah and the Israelites associated with him. And take another stick of wood and write on it, belonging to Joseph. That is to Ephraim and all the Israelites associated with him. Join them together into one stick so that they become one in your hand. Can we move on, Charles? Next slide. Thanks. When your people ask you, won't you tell us what you mean by this? Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am going to take the stick of Joseph, which is in Ephraim's hand, and of the Israelite tribes associated with him, and join it to Judah's stick, and I will make it into a single stick of wood that they will become one in my hand. Hold before their eyes the sticks you have written on and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land of the mountains of Israel. Is there any more of that? No. Okay, thank you. We, we can go back to the start. I'll call that up in a minute. Um, so here was a symbol, two sticks. Because we have come through the chaotic kingdom stage. Remember? Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Israel had already fallen to the Assyrians over a hundred years before. And they were like, that's ten tribes gone. But Ezekiel is given this prophetic symbolism. He takes us two sticks and he makes them one. And it's prophetic. 
But think about this. This is amazing. It's a prophecy that will take 2,500 years to come to pass. 2,400 plus. Okay? 2,400 years. I don't know how old you are, but that's a long time. <laughs> it's a long, long time. And I'm sure in the intervening years, before 1948, people will say, well, we don't know about this prophecy. It's very unlikely. If we look at Middle Eastern history, <coughs> there is no nation that has been dispersed in the same way that has ever come back. I told you so many civilizations, hundreds that we could name, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, uh, Amalekites, you can keep, keep on going. They don't exist amongst them. They're no longer around. But here is this one nation whom God has identified as being His people. That He is their God. And He prophesied this through Ezekiel that one day they will be together again. He will draw them out of the nations. In 1948, this has happened. I've been to Israel several times. It is solely a remarkable nation. They have reclaimed the desert. They, they have actually, the habitable land has been extended. More and more land has become green. This last visit last year in, in March, saw the desert in blue. And then, it wasn't what I saw in 1974. But the point I'm making here is that God is true to His Word. And He will bring about that which we as human mortal beings consider impossible. And when God pronounces something, it shall come to pass. Doesn't matter how long, doesn't matter what gets in the way, but when God says something, it is going to come to pass. And that is the one thing that we can count on. <laughs> is life tough? Fairly. Whatever way you look at it, I don't think anyone can really realistically say, ah, oh, it's easy, it's no struggle. Every problem, I've never had problems in my life. Anybody? <laughs> anyone want to raise your hand? I've never had a single problem in my life. If you raise your hand, it might be from another dimension <laughs> or another planet. Impossible, right? We come wailing and struggling into the world. Right from the moment we arrive, we are crying because we need sustenance. We need care. And right from that first whale, we are pretty much in need all the days of our lives. But what is God doing? And sometimes we don't even know. And quite often we can be placed in circumstances where we don't know what is going on. Have you been there? Have you been there? You've gone through a period of time and you're saying, what is going on? I really don't understand. At other times, you may be seeming like, oh, everything is good. There's wind in the sails and, and the horizon looks like clear skies. And then all of a sudden, out of left wing somewhere, Sorry, bad side. Out of left wing somewhere, a storm hits you. And where did we get that phrase? I didn't see that coming. Right? Out of nowhere, something hits you. And you're left in that position of, what is going on? Why is this happening? Well, if either of those two experiences resonate with you, this is exactly where 
Ezekiel was. Imagine he was given what he understood to be a message of repentance. And he was assured in his heart, God was saying, if the people heed this and they repent, then destruction will not be for them. But he tried everything, lying on his side, lying on that side, standing up, starving himself, doing all kinds of things, but to naught. And now he is in captivity. He is feeling bound. He is feeling broken. He is in a desert, desolate place in his life. Not just physically, which it is, but emotionally, spiritually, mentally. He is strained, he is tired. All of his efforts, all of his ministry have effectively, in his understanding, come to nothing. Well, if you are remotely, I hope you are not in as bad a situation as Ezekiel, but if you are feeling drained and tired, then today's message is for you. I pray, I, I really have this sense of anticipation that God is going to touch some of you in that very, very dry place. Now let's look at this passage then. Uh, this vision, the valley of dry bones, is given to Ezekiel by the Spirit of the Lord. And he's taken to a valley and everywhere, what does he see? Dry bones. What comes to mind is uh, over 20 years ago, I went on a dive trip to this island of Sipanan. You can Google it. It's an atoll. It, it rises 2,000 feet from the ocean floor. And the island be becomes like this. It, it's this, and then there's a limestone pinnacle. So you can actually dive under the island. And under it, there's a marking, this is your hut. <laughs> you're, you're diving under your hut. But one of the features of this island is a cave. And it's called the Turtle Graveyard. And it says that Turtles go there to die. Uh, when I looked at it, it's more like turtles got lost and they didn't know how to come out. <laughs> but anyway, whether you subscribe to myth or not, one of these sites that has burned in, into my consciousness was coming down into the cave and you actually have to go through a channel like that. And it's just this wide. But you come out into this cavern which is about the size of this room and it's just bones and shells. You can see the turtle ribcage and you can see the turtle shells, broken turtle skulls and it's just, I don't know how deep but it's obviously just piles and piles of bones. So that's what comes to mind when I think of Ezekiel's vision because otherwise I haven't seen anything uh, close to that. Thankfully. But in, in that cave, uh, underwater where I was, because of its depth and the, the enclosure, there's no movement. You know, when you shine your light, you can see all the particles in the water, and even those particles aren't moving. And, and you just shine the light, and you can imagine the lights cutting through the, the particles, and, and then you just see death. Layers and layers of dry bones. And this vision comes to Ezekiel. He's, probably, he's seeing more than a cavern. He's seeing a whole valley. And the Spirit is taking him through like 3D. And God says to him, can these bones live? Or if I think back to that turtle cave, probably say no. It's gone. It's done. It's finished. It, the only way these bones are going is towards ash. They will just continue to degrade. What, what life? There's no science that we know of that can regenerate these bones. And in today, 2,500 years after Ezekiel, how much more advanced are we in science? So you can imagine for Ezekiel, can these bones live? 
And Ezekiel is quite crafty, I think. He puts the question back to God. This is the statue of the man. He questions God. He says, you ask me? You are the one who knows. Thou knows. I don't know the answer. But actually, it's a response of faith. Is it not? He doesn't decide for himself, no. It's not possible. The premise of him saying, you know, is because he recognizes that God can do anything that he wants. And God can do whatever he decides. There is nothing that is impossible with God. So he says, you ask me, I am mortal. I can't see life here. But you know, because if you want life, there shall be light. So this is my first takeaway for you today. Whatever situation you are in, your redemption, that first lifeline that you throw out is the lifeline of faith. You must believe. Jesus said, right? According to your faith, so shall it be done. A stirring question. What do we believe? And I think the Valley of Dry Bones is a place of examination. When we stand in the Valley of Dry Bones and we peruse the scenery around us and all we see is decay. Decay that has followed death. Then it forces us to find out and answer this question. What do I believe? Thankfully, I haven't had too many valley of dry bone periods in my life. But there have been. And it's led me to this conclusion. Better than just to ask myself, what do I believe? The key to the answer is a slightly different question. Who do I believe? Pardon the grammar. It's deliberately flow. Who do I believe? It is not what. It is who that determines what. Is it not? We are created for relationship. We don't believe in things. We don't believe in methodologies. We believe in a person. And it is that person who is going to make all the difference. So Ezekiel is responding to that person and he says, you know, I don't know, but you do. And it's, as I said, a response of faith. Now the vision that is given Ezekiel is actually a prophetic vision of the nation of Israel. On this level of prophecy, long-term prophecy, this vision is about the nation of Israel. That they will be scattered to the four winds of the earth and they will be dispersed. And history, it did, and it would record over a period that the nation of Israel is no more. They have been scattered. They are slaves. They are Captives, eh? some of them have done well in other places, but there is no longer a nation. But the prophecy is that God would restore that which was deep, deep. So we see, fortunately, we live post 1948 and we are able to witness. This prophecy has been fulfilled. Now, how does it apply to us? 
Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4 says, The church is one body and one spirit. And in a body, we have structure. And if we look at our bodies, the reason we can stand and move is because we have a skeleton. We have bones and there is a structure. And it's important for us to work within that structure. Paul tells us we are different parts, but we are all one body. And I would like to just quickly say that we want to move forward as a church this year. Uh, now that everyone is back in the new school year, we would like to get small groups going. There is already a biological term for that, cell groups, so that we can care for one another. So that we, we don't have people falling through the cracks, so to speak. And, and we acknowledge that uh, there have been situations where people have gone through hospitalization and difficult times, and we haven't been able to offer the care that we, we could have or should have. Okay? But we want to try and uh, improve on that, and we seek your help. Okay? If you have your home or an opportunity and you're prepared to, to have a small group of people around you so that you can keep in touch with, uh, that you can feed back to us and say, oh, so-and-so is not well, she's been in hospital, so-and-so lost his job or whatever it is and we got to pray for them, so-and-so has been warded, somebody needs to visit them. Let's try and be uh, all united as a family help us and we'll, we'll get announcements out to you so that we, we can um, connect with more people and hopefully uh, offer a better level of care. Now, when we look at this Valley of Dry Bones, here's the other interesting uh, image that I want to bring to you. Ezekiel had before him a vision of what could be life. There were bones there, right? He had the ingredients. And then he actually sees the bones come together. You know the song? Yes? The, the what bone is connected to the what bone and, and so forth. And the skeleton, the bones come together and sinews start to, to grow on them and muscle and flesh and yet it's dead. Now, I want to just quickly make the point that we can have all the ingredients for life and yet not have life. And there are some churches, there I say, that have all the ingredients for body life. But actually, you've heard the, the term, a dead church. You, you go there and you feel people are going through the motions and, and there isn't any life. And this is something we should all long after and pray for and work towards. That when a guest comes in, they should feel there is life here. There, there are people living in God's presence. Their faces are glowing, for example. I always say it's such a beautiful image of Moses going up the mountain and being in the presence of God. And what was the fruit of that? He glowed. It wasn't something he put on. It's not something he had to do. It was a consequence of being in the presence of God. If God is alive and working in our midst, we should glow. <laughs> there should be something of the radiance of Christ in our lives that is attractive. And people have said to me, oh, I don't know how to go out and witness. I don't know how to share. Actually, the truth is, if you are walking sufficiently in the presence of God, people should be asking you questions. This is not to make you feel guilty. Please don't go away. Oh, nobody's ever asked me a question. I must be terrible. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm saying let's hunger and thirst for God's presence in our lives. I'm going to facetiously give this example. You know the book, the famous book, The Purpose Driven Life? by Rick Warren, well, I'm going to cheekily say, if I ever wrote another book, I'm inclined to title it, The Presence Driven Life. Because I believe that if we are in the presence of God, we will understand purpose. 
Purpose will be a consequence of being in His presence. And I want to encourage each one of us in our own way to hunger and to desire and to put in place where you seek the presence of God in your life. And that doesn't mean, oh, I got to set aside, Pastor, I'm so busy, I got little ones running, people pulling me every which way, I got students, I got reports, I got whatever. Yes, you can be busy. But all the more, you want to seek the presence of God. Even in the midst of your business. Invite the Lord's presence into your class. Invite Him into your car while you sit in a traffic jam. Invite Him into the field when you're coaching soccer, George. Be aware. Just have that portion of your brain that is aware of the presence of God. And invite Him into every part of your life. Don't, don't live this partition life and this is my life and that's my life before God and if this is bigger then that becomes smaller. That's a doomsday <laughs> equation. It's going to end in failure, okay? But if you have them one on top of another, you can invite the presence of God into everything that you do. How in the world would Paul say, I pray without ceasing? Look at what he did. The amount of responsibilities he had. But yet he could say, I pray that more, more than all of you, and I pray without ceasing. I think it's because he invited the presence of God into everything that he did. Okay? So likewise, you can do so. Now you can have all the potential and not have life. And that would be a shame. If we have all the ingredients to succeed and yet there is no success. So we need to pull it all together. That is the challenge. To have what it takes to make it work. That's what people get paid for, isn't it, Alan? You, you can have all the things to make a car, but if you don't have what it takes to make it work, it's no use. You can have all the parts. This is what the vision is saying. You can have all the parts, but you need what it takes to bring it to life. I chanced upon a TED talk, and I do like those clips there. They are quite helpful most of the time. And there was this uh, young lady presenting the outcome of her research. And what had she been researching? Apparently, she had been researching what ingredient goes into making people succeed. So their tests went something like this. They would have a group of freshmen. And they would interview those freshmen. And then they would try to predict who in this cohort of freshmen is going to succeed as a senior. Okay? So they would take all these samples of freshmen and seniors, uh, new people in the military, new people in the commercial world, you name it, kindergarten, and then they would follow through and they would interview them and get them to fill in questionnaires and tests and forms and whatever. And they would try to sit down and say, can we predict whether a person will succeed? But before you can predict whether a person will succeed, you need to know what contributes towards success, right? There must be something there that successful people have in common. So, apparently they had to go by a process of elimination. And in that process they said, well, surprise, it's not intelligence. There are those who are highly intelligent who don't succeed. I know what you're all thinking, EQ. No, even those with EQ and intelligence, still not predictable. The, the results were random. Okay? Finance. No. Opportunity. No. Circumstance. No. So they were striking off all the boxes. And it's like, what in the world? What are we left with? And to cut to the chase, she said, you know what? Our conclusion at the end of the study was there's this rather intangible thing that we call grit. 
the people who had grit were the ones who were going to succeed. It didn't matter their level of intelligence, their finances, their circumstances, their background, their inabilities, their abilities. Doesn't matter. None of it. Grit. Her conclusion was, we need to be grittier about inculcating grit in our children. I see all the teachers and educators going, yeah. that's what we need. I listened to that talk and it resonated with me. Because I am a child of a generation that went through World War II. I didn't. But when I was growing up, we were just coming out of the war. And life was difficult. And I see the difference between my parents and my children. And there's something in my parents' generation and all their contemporaries who've been through a world war, who in Singapore context lived through an occupation. But something of that moral fiber that I recognize and freely admit I do not have. This character and strength and grit was forged in a desolate I don't think we, need, we can replicate it and we don't want to. My father tells me of stories of as a teenager watching people being beheaded. For no reason. Just picked out of a line. Gone. That must do something to you. But I would like to be a bit more positive and say in the, as, in the absence of such amazing uh, circumstances, we do need to make our children tough. Doing everything for them is not the solution. Some things we got to find on our own, and some things God allows us to discover in the valley of the shadow of death. There are those valley of the shadow of death lessons that can't be learned on the mountain and can't be forged in the sunshine. They can only be tempered in the dark shadows. So don't be afraid, is what I'm saying. Don't be afraid. Paul had such deep wisdom and revelation when he says all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. So what do you believe? And let's move on. Ezekiel does the next important thing. He, act, he acted in obedience. His first was he acted by faith, right? He had to believe. And he says, God, you know, I believe in you. You tell me. If you want to bring life, there will be life. But then he had to do something. And this is the point I want you to take. You don't just say, okay, God, you know, so you do. And I'll just sit back and watch. Our faith calls us to action. We need to participate. We don't just sit back. David still had to gather five stones. Someone just asked me last week, why five stones? I said, I don't know. Maybe it's our human uncertainty. We have the in case I miss syndrome. So we have plan B, C, D, E. But the lesson, surely, of David's five stones is that God never misses. He only needs that one if we trust him. Okay? But David had to act. He had to pick up those stones. He had to put it in a sling. He could have run. He could have said, I have a bad feeling about this. This is not a good idea. Or, whoa, I didn't know he was that big. My stones are too small. This ain't going to penetrate that skull. 
We don't have that. He acted in faith. You come against me with spear and sword, you got no idea. What did David believe? Who did David believe? You, Goliath, have no idea what you are up against. If I were you, I would run. What a wonderful reversal of perspective. Amen? So we can come against the giants of circumstance that intimidate us. We can come against what is threatening to overwhelm us. And we can speak to that circumstance or that situation or that relationship, whatever it may be, and say, if I were you, I'd get out of here because I come in the name of the living God. You have no idea who I know and in whom I believe. Amen. Do not be anxious for anything. But by prayer and supplication, make your request known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind. This was the manifestation in Ezekiel's life. I didn't plan to share this. But this sermon has been encouragement for me. Three weeks ago, Lynn had to apply for her visa, for a retirement visa in Thailand, which required a full medical check. And out of nowhere, from left field, the scan comes back, she's got a block in her artery. And in a nutshell, the doctor says it's not that serious, 25% block. But your symptoms don't bear up with the scan. Your symptoms are far worse than what the scan is showing. So the doctor suddenly says, okay, if it's 25%, it's treatable by medication. So you try that, you come back in October. So we were settled with that. And then we come back, and this last week, she suddenly has pain at rest. And so we call the doctor, and he says, that's not good. It's not commensurate with the scan. You better come, and we need to go in and have a look. So we fly tomorrow morning. She will have a heart procedure on Tuesday. But I want to share this with you. We are at peace. Don't worry for us. And it's not a denial of the circumstances. I've cared for many people who've got this kind of news and with this circumstance. I'm saying this works. This works. We're not afraid. Because nothing is going to overwhelm us. We say, Lord, let it come. Your will be done. Whatever, whatever comes, it will not overwhelm us. <coughs> what a blessed assurance is that. Many people have said, we will pray, we will pray for healing. Yeah, sure. That is yeah, the word of God. We pray for healing. But we are not anxious about that. You understand? This peace of God that passes understanding has come back to me. And it's reminded me of the time when we were told Yana's fetus was in danger of Elm syndrome. And we said, let it come. And this peace like a blanket 
I feel it again. The outcome does not matter. I say that all of my heart. We are not worried. We are joyful, but in all of these, we are more than conquerors because of Christ. We can't tell what will happen tomorrow, how two days hence, but it does not matter what happens day after tomorrow. Because we know who holds tomorrow. I want for you to have this assurance. I want that you will have this peace in whatever circumstance. Do me a favor. Lynn does not know I'm sharing this. As of five minutes ago, I didn't know I was going to share. But please don't go land on her after service. In fact, observe her. Don't say anything. You can stand by her and say a prayer. But you will see. There is no anxiety. There is no fear. There is the joy and the peace of the Lord. And it's not because of how great we are. Please don't misunderstand the sharing. That is not at all. All I'm trying to say is, this is for real. Trust in the word of God. It works. So Ezekiel acts out of obedience. Right? He prophesies to the bones as God instructed him. And he says to the four winds, let the Ruach the Spirit of God come and bring life. Because now the bones have come together, the sinew has gone on, the muscle has gone on, the flesh has gone on. But only God can speak life. Only God can breathe life. We actually have medically everything that is there for the ingredients of life. They got artificial heart, artificial kidneys, artificial everything. But no scientist or doctor can breathe life. That is the sovereign ability of the only living God. But when we act in obedience, we can release this life. You see that? We can bring life to that which is dead if we act in obedience. What does he do in his act? He speaks life. And I want to encourage you with this. We have a gift. We have a precious gift, brothers and sisters. We have been made in the image of God. And unlike any other creature in all of creation, we speak. Nothing else in all of creation, and dare I say an entire universe, speaks. Because you have been made in the image of God and bestowed this gift of speech. And we can speak to dry bones in obedience to God. And in the valley of the shadow of death, there can and there will be life. Nothing is impossible. I don't know about you, but that is so amazing. That is worthy of testimony. That must surely be worthy of sharing. Are there relationships in your life? There are in mine that at this point in time seem to be dead. Do you have dreams? I do. They seem impossible to realize. Are there circumstances that appear to be hopeless? We are all then like Ezekiel. 
But take heart from the story. Because you have the ability to speak. Go and read God's word and speak life. What is prayer? What is prayer? Apart from communication with God and all of one aspect of prayer that is so beautiful, it is the speaking of words of life. Isn't that what prayer is? We bring life back to what is dead. That is what prayer is. There is nothing dead that the living God cannot resurrect. That's why His crunch point, His focal point of His whole message is He brought His Son back from the dead. Nobody else, no religion, no cult, no other group in all of history has a leader that has come back. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, yes. That is your assurance. This is a God of life. And I want to end with this. People have said Thailand is a difficult place to share the gospel. What is an easy place? What is an easy place? We are in battle because the prince of this world does not want anyone to have a relationship and eternal life with the living God, right? Okay. Every battle is going to be difficult. Thailand is no different. Yes, the history seems to make it slightly more difficult. But here is the word of the Lord to us today in 2017 in Bangna. My people, go and speak words of life in obedience to my word. And if you speak words of life, then even dry bones. What is the, this phrase, this prefix, dry? There's absolutely no hope. There's no life. It's dry. It's gone. It's decayed. It's nothing. It's not even moist. There isn't some semblance of life in there. These are dry bones. Even in the valley of dry bones, if you will speak words of life, I will bring life. Oh, can this be our prayer together? For our school, for our neighborhoods, for this nation? We are a people called to bring words of life. And it's not our words. We speak the word of the living God. He is the one who will bring life back if we would but speak. Can this country live in Christ? Thou knows. We know too. Let's pray. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Words of grace and beauty. Words of wonder. Words of love, beautiful words, wonderful words, words of life. Yes, Lord, speak this word of life to each one of our weary spirits. Bring light. Let there be light where there is darkness. Let there be peace where there is conflict. Give us these words of life by your Ruach. Breathe in us afresh as we go forth. To 
be your speakers. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. The grace of our resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, the love and the words of life of God our Father, the Ruach, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, be upon each of you as you go forth to be His mouthpieces. Go then in the name of Jesus.